Hello and welcome back to the Beyond the Scenes podcast. I'm Molly Elizabeth Agnew, the founder of Eternal Goddess, and on today's episode I'm going to be talking to Rosie Hart at the Royal Wardrobe on TikTok. When I say royal in mourning clothing, I'm 99% sure that the royal you think of is Queen Victoria, and while of course we will touch on her, we're going to talk about the Queen Mother and her mourning clothing when her mother died. It was not traditional in the royal British sense, but a very fascinating topic, so I do hope you enjoy. If you'd like to keep up to date with future episodes of the podcast and more from Eternal Goddess, make sure you're following us on Instagram. Hello Rosie, thank you so much for joining us. Could you quickly go through who you are, what you do, where people can find you? Yes, so I'm Rosie Hart. I'm a fashion historian. I mainly look at royal fashion and I run the TikTok account, The Royal Wardrobe, uh, where I talk about lots of royal fashion. Um, I've also written the book, The Royal Wardrobe, which will be out next year with headline publishing, which you can pre-order right now on Amazon or wherever you like to get your books. Um, And you can also find me over on Instagram and my handle is Rosie H Hart. Perfect. Thank you so much. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So when we think of morning clothing, I think most people will think of Queen Victoria because that's an image that we have very much set in our head and we will touch on that. Um, but before we, before we start talking about the Queen Mother and all of that, can you explain a little bit about morning clothing in general, especially in relation to the 19th century, because they took it really bloody seriously <laughs> yeah. um, and sort of, sort of the rules and regulations surrounding that? Yes. So morning dress and, and traditions to do with morning that have links to material culture have been around for a really, really long time. Um, you can look back as far as like the Tudor court to see that they have all these complicated rules about what can and can't be worn during mourning periods. Um, and it's, it's really an integral part of lots of different cultures and bubbles of society. But yes, it was the 19th century where it really comes into its own. It really matures. And there are lots of reasons why the 19th century particularly became this hub for mourning culture. And one of the big reasons is in the 19th century, people's attitudes to death began to change. Um, and it's, it's so interesting because it is so different to our current attitudes towards death um, because there were so many sort of pandemics and illnesses going around. You know, death was such a central part of people's lives it was something that you know you'd have frequent encounters with um and so it was it was very much encouraged that it was something that you should talk about and you should embrace and you shouldn't shy away from it was something that was you were encouraged to be public with the way that you mourned um and the way that you discussed death because you know it was just it was a necessary skill to have in life to be able to cope with death in a healthy way and also with the industrial revolution the impact of that the uh, increase in this commercial culture if there is a push to make something public like uh, you know this discussion about mourning there's going to be lots of objects items that are being pushed to help help people with that so whether that's artwork made out of the hair of the deceased or a very complex set of rules to do with what you should and shouldn't wear during the mourning period. It all comes out of that um, sort of increased commercial culture. Obviously, we look at we look at Queen Victoria, and she is a widow that wears black for a lot of years. Um, and I think a lot of people might think, oh, that's really exaggerated, really extra. And of course, she was really extra and <laughs> took everything a little bit too far. But she was a monarch, so <laughs> a pop off, I guess. But. Um, how realistic was that? How how long were these mourning periods that impacted how you wore your clothes and what you wore and the relationship to the deceased and so on? Yes, yeah, so there were lots of lots and lots of manuals, um, etiquette guides that sort of tried to set out the rules for how long you should be in mourning for, what sort of specific clothing choices were acceptable for different parts of the mourning process um, no one could really agree a hundred percent on what the what the the specific rules should be but you can you can see sort of patterns that are followed 
in terms of the length of time that you would mourn and wear mourning clothes, that was generally dependent on how close you were to the person that passed away. So it could be anywhere from three months if it was like a distant relative to a year for full mourning, multiple years if it was um, if you were very very committed to it and of course you know personal feelings play a big part in sort of how long you want to mourn for which you see with Queen Victoria. Um, In terms of the specific types of clothing you would wear during that stage the general consensus was for the first period the most intense period of mourning which is generally referred to as full mourning you would wear black and you would choose fabrics that had no luster to them, that they were incredibly dull, incredibly plain. Um, In terms of surface embellishment, it was very, very minimal. So you might be allowed sort of a a panel of of like ruffles or like one one tiny little detail, but again, in very plain, um, unpretentious fabrics. As the morning period progressed, Uh, You would reach, you know, a few months in, you might be allowed to start um, including some lace into your outfit. So maybe a a lace collar, a few white elements like that. Um, There are lots, there's lots of advice on uh, when you can start adding ribbons and flowers back into your bonnets, things like that. Um, And then you reach half mourning which is you know it it depends again when you would enter half mourning but then you would allow you were allowed to be a little bit more lenient with what you wore um so you might begin to introduce some more lustrous fabrics into your wardrobe you might um, add more surface embellishment you're also allowed to introduce new colors um colors like white purples greys um in some cases i've even seen references to like bronze being acceptable shades for half mourning and what's really interesting is that a lot of women a lot of widows would choose to continue half mourning for the rest of their lives so when we talk about queen victoria being in mourning for you know the the rest of her life after prince albert died it wasn't completely unheard of she was very intense about it but you know lots of widows committed themselves to a sort of um, mourning dress for the rest of their life you can definitely see in a lot of cases like a shift um you know if their spouse has passed away we need to now start talking about the Queen Mother, which is, I, I never see anyone talk about the Queen Mother, especially <laughs> in relation to fashion. Um, and I'm sure that many people won't know what we're going to talk about. So she was, at one point in time, a bit of a fashion trend setter. Um, and I think we, we look at her and we see this really old, frail woman that, you know, died in 2002 and wore, you know, not exactly flattering clothing, but she was 100 years old. So, yeah, you can um, excuse it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's allowed. But at a time in point, she was really important to the fashion industry, like all royals are. But when she became queen, she obviously had more power. Um, and then they they took a trip to France, her and King George. And this is where the white wardrobe comes in. So would you like to give some context to to this entire story? What is the white wardrobe and why was she wearing white and not black to mourn? Yes, yeah, so when we talk about the white wardrobe, we're talking about a collection of clothes that were made for... Um, the Queen Mother, when she was Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Consort, um, in the late 1930s. And it was this collection was made for her by the incredible designer Norman Hartnell, who she was just in the the beginning stages of a a very long um, career of working with him. So it was this incredible, incredible journey that was planned for the Queen and King to Paris. And it was it was a monumental occasion. It was right after their coronation. It was this really important occasion. So lots of money was invested into this. There was so much uh, sort of 
discussion about it in the press. It was huge. And Norman Hartnell was tasked with creating this incredible wardrobe. And even though the tour was only supposed to be a couple of days, you know, there were multiple wardrobe changes that needed to be factored in um, on each day. She was going to about five banquets, um, the opera. She was going to... Uh, drive-bys and she was visiting dignitaries and she needed a new outfit for absolutely every single one of those occasions so it was it was no small task and Hartnell went away and he looked at the locations that she was going to be appearing at he looked at the architecture the uniforms that would be worn around her so that he could create this wardrobe that would help her stand out so he really carefully selected all of the colours for these clothes and they were all ready to go these he was so excited to have these clothes out on the world stage and then disaster struck in the royal family right before they were due to leave um, to go to paris the queen's mother passed away the countess of strathmore passed away and this was very very difficult for queen elizabeth this was she was very very close to her mother she was a family girl she you know was very down to earth and she was also a little bit traditional as a lot of the royal family were at the time so for her you know it was it was non-negotiable she couldn't go on and she couldn't wear these really colorful clothes she needed to be in mourning even though kind of mourning traditions weren't quite as um, robust anymore in sort of the rest of society so they didn't want to cancel the trip. It was very important that they still went. They just postponed it by a few weeks because all of this money and effort had gone into into the planning. So the Queen called Norman Hartnell to the palace and told him that the trip was still going ahead, but she wouldn't be able to wear any of these lovely, lovely clothes that he had created for her. And he needed to whip up some morning clothes really quickly. And he wasn't happy about this. Norman Hartnell had a really clear image about what he wanted the Queen Mother to look like, or Queen Elizabeth at the time. He had this really succinct vision, and for him, the colour black just did not fit into that at all. He was really kind of upset about that and, and was wanted to argue against it. He, in his autobiography, says that it's to do with the fact that, you know, Europe was in a tough time um, at, at the time of the tour and, oh, I thought it would be so, you know, it would be so sad if we sent the Queen over in black, you know, it's supposed to be a lovely occasion. No, he, he, had, he had a vision, a creative vision. He knew how important this would be for his career. He didn't want to lose this opportunity. So he sits down with the Queen and they try and, and sort of discuss what they're going to do. And he remembers that historically in the French court, rather than wearing black for periods of mourning, courtiers and the royals would wear white instead. So he suggests to the Queen Mother that it might be a, you know, a, nice, a nice touch, a little diplomatic nod to the French if they decide to have her wardrobe made in white fabric. And eventually the Queen Mother agrees to this and he goes away and he has about a couple of weeks to transform all of these clothes into beautiful, a beautiful white wardrobe. And that's how the white wardrobe came into existence. It's such a genius little workaround. Like, I, I wish I'd been a fly on the wall the moment he had that, like, oh, bingo, light bulb moment. I'm going to make this work. Yeah, I don't, I don't think any fashion designer really wants to create a collection all in black. No. Um, it's, it's a little bit, well, I, Kanye West would do it. But anyway, <laughs> um, not, not the point. Um, now, what I've always found so fascinating about this entire saga of, of, of the white wardrobe and what initially actually got me interested in it was that when they left for tour to get on the train she wore black when she got off the train she was wearing white and obviously that was very thoroughly thought through and done on purpose um but it made an impact to me in the present day so clearly it made an impact then what exactly did these clothes look like because you look at the images and she doesn't look like your typical 1930s fashion icon. She doesn't look like Wallace Simpson. Um, what no. was the silhouette like? What were the designs like? 
So one of the things that Norman Hartnell is sort of really remembered for is his quite old-fashioned style of designing. He liked to look... Yeah, he so he liked to look back into the past and and find his inspiration in in galleries and in paintings. So a lot of his clothes borrowed just sort of subtly from um, historical fashion moments. Now, obviously, if you're designing for a member of the royal family, particularly if you're designing for the queen you do have a bit of leniency. There's always been this idea, and it kind of particularly became apparent to people during the early 20th century, that the royals kind of get to play by their own rules. They get to, you know, sort of be a little bit more extra, a little bit more dramatic, um, you know, than the average person would be. And that was something that people began to sort of expect and crave from their royals. So... Hartnell was allowed sort of free reign with his his designing here and he ended up looking at portraits by the Victorian artist the incredible Victorian artist Franz Xaver Winterhalter um, for his inspiration and now they feature sort of lovely beautiful sheer fabrics that are layered over these beautiful wide crinolines and and just decorated with lace and they're, they're just gorgeous to look at and so fairy like and that was that was the point so the white wardrobe featured sort of these big crinoline skirts they were covered with really delicate lace they were a little bit glitzy they had sort of great um swooshing skirts there was just something really really romantic about them and that was really clever because it appealed to the British public because Franz Xaver Winterhalter had kind of made some of the greatest portraits of Queen Victoria um, and also her daughters and the royal family around that time but also it appealed to the French because he uh, Winterhalter had also created some very very famous portraits of Empress Eugenie so it spoke to sort of a history a shared history um, between these two countries so it was a very very clever diplomatic choice um, so the the clothes are just it, you know you, it almost feels like you're looking at um, a queen from the 19th century rather than a queen from the 1930s for sure I think I think she genuinely looked angelic um, and and, and that relationship that she held with Norman Hartnell through the years, um, even even when she wasn't um, the Queen Consort anymore, they kind of kept that whole identity. Um, but I do think it worked for her um, because she was competing at the time with Wallace Simpson, who was, she was born for the 1930s. She had the perfect desired silhouette for it. She pulled off the sleek, sometimes androgynous mm. um, styles, and the Queen Mother just wasn't like that. Um, so she, she, she did carve out her own way, and it stuck in our memories. Now, there is a, there is a rumour about one section of the white wardrobe, and I'd love your input on it, because I, I never know if it's true <laughs> or not. I, I think probably not. The Marie Antoinette parasol, um, was it? <laughs> I'm assuming no, but was yeah, it? Yeah, so there are lots of this kind of like historical inspiration in the wardrobe and right down to the accessories. And um, the Queen often, if she was in a, doing a daytime appearance um, in Paris, she was holding a beautiful lace parasol. Um, and it was included in the... Um, very famous photographs uh, taken by Cecil Beaton afterwards. So it's become kind of this staple of the look. Um, and yes, there is this rumour that kind of goes around that this parasol belonged to Marie Antoinette and it just kind of appears in all of these as kind of just like a throwaway line in lots of books and lots of articles and things. But I cannot find one single like reliable source that kind of proves that this is a, a genuine um, parasol from like the, the 1700s. I I am of the opinion that it was um, that it was like a sort of myth that was created around the time to kind of feed into the magic of this look. Um, and I I think yeah, it tells us something about how successful. 
um, Norman Hartnell's vision was in creating this sort of glorious, glittery queen that's like fit for the French public. But yes, I don't, I don't think it was an original. I did, the thing is, it is sort of believable. Like I did, I did believe it for like. I'm not going to say it's split second. I believed it for a while <laughs> until I started, you know, I bothered to use my critical thinking skills and was like, mm, we've never seen it again. Where did it go? Where was it beforehand? Um, surely it didn't just disappear into thin air because um, we, we, we don't really have anything with Marie Antoinette. Um, overall, especially in France, how was this received? Um, her fashion because I know we look back on it now but at the time obviously it had an impact but especially the French did they really grow to love this queen oh my gosh the French public ate this wardrobe up they were obsessed with it there wasn't a single person I think that kind of turned their nose up at this and thought you know it was too much or it was you know it didn't suit her people were obsessed even as the tour was still happening, Norman Hartnell was getting calls and letters from people sort of, you know, desperate to talk to him about his creative process and, and you know, if there, if there were going to be any more of these dresses that we were going to be seeing. Um, it, was, it was a sensation. She just, this wardrobe captured people immediately. It was really a special moment for Elizabeth in terms of her her fashion going onwards up until that point she had kind of been in this awkward relationship with 1920s and 1930s fashion it was a style that you know just didn't naturally suit her um and so this this was a wardrobe that was tailor-made for her and for her image she just kind of radiated this queenly sort of light and it just it it completely captured people's attention from a professional standpoint as well for Norman Hartnell it was a career defining moment he was sort of awash with all this praise from uh, French fashion critics and this was this is what he had been hoping for when he sort of was given this responsibility so I bet he felt um, very very proud and I think he deserved to feel that way um, but it continued to impact and inspire people um, particularly Christian Dior when he created his new look when he was sort of bringing out these pieces which when you look at them you can see similarities you know the sort of um, wide dramatic skirts with a very small waist and just like very delicate elements to it um, when he was sort of displaying them at one particular um, show where he invited a group of journalists, he also invited Norman Hartnell to come and have a look. And a journalist was sort of asking him about his inspiration and he, he answered the question, he said, whenever I try and think of something beautiful, whenever I try and make something beautiful, I think about that wardrobe that uh, Norman Hartnell made for your queen all those years ago. So. And, you know, people talk about the new look as this sort of in, like central defining moment for 20th century women's fashion. And, you know, it, it was inspired massively by the white wardrobe. So its impact is, is huge. It's, you know, we, we owe a lot to it. We really do. So we started this episode by talking about extreme mourning um, and then about how the Queen Mother was relatively traditional and and she took it pretty pretty seriously and then um we had the death of prince philip and that was the first time in a very long time actually since the queen mother's passing um in 2002 that we saw members of the royal family in mourning and i don't want to say i was interested because that sounds a little bit weird surrounding <laughs> someone's death um but i was really intrigued to see how they were going to go around mourning clothing um in the modern day um through a, a pandemic how that was gonna uh, merge um for me i was very interested to see what the duchess of cambridge wore she is one of my personal style inspirations um and she wore that stunning black um dress coat what did what did you take away from from all of the morning surrounding Prince Philip and and the style surrounding that? Yes, yeah, so obviously it it 
came at a, a very strange time for the world and also for the royal family in that uh, when the Duke of Edinburgh passed away it was sort of the height of Covid there were all of these lockdown restrictions so um, his funeral itself was sort of reduced significantly you know there was only central members of the family who were you know in attendance and obviously I think it was very you know very quite traditional morning clothes everybody in black was all very sensible um but you know it, it didn't have the same kind of gravitas that we've seen historically um in royal funerals and you know I don't think that's uh, an indication that like the the queen for example wasn't kind of feeling as intense as i don't know queen victoria felt when she lost prince albert um, i i think it has a lot to do with the time that it, it happened you know everyone was going through a really tough period um and i think it, they they were aware it would have seemed really tasteless if they sort of you know went very intense with their mourning and invested in like lots and lots and lots of black clothes to wear for all of the engagements kind of afterwards so it was very much like we're going to take a break from engagements we're going to go to the funeral we're going to wear black going to take another little break and then we're going to get back to it but i also think a big part of that is just it's the way the duke of edinburgh was um in life it was like you know you've got a you've got a job to do you've got to get it done like let's not kind of you know mess around with this like his his funeral you know just the way it was planned and obviously he had a huge hand in the in the planning process it was very much like you know this is what i've done in life this is what i achieved these are my titles these are, this is my family like let's have a moment and, and and it'll be great um but the really interesting the really interesting part was actually the um memorial service that happened a year later um and obviously you know lockdown restrictions were eased so there was a bigger crowd of people there you know, we saw lots of foreign royals attending as well which is always very exciting when we see them together um but one of the really interesting things was there was a real divide in what people were wearing sort of half of the crowd were dressed in black you know that's pretty self-explanatory but the other half were all wearing green like the uh, the same shade of sort of dark green which you know it has it's, it was great to see because green or this particular shade edinburgh green um is was the livery color for the duke of edinburgh and actually for the queen as well when they got married and they were the duke and duchess of edinburgh they picked this color for um sort of all their household uniforms um and also their their cars and things like that and it was something that prince philip uh, Prince Philip kept up until his death. So the fact that the, there, were, there was a significant portion of the crowd dressed in green, in his colour specifically, was sort of a really nice like, personal nod to, to him. It wasn't sort of like general mourning. It, it felt very personal. Perfect. Rosie, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Before we go, can you, like you did at the beginning, please plug yourself, um, your book, where people can find you on social media? Yes, if you're interested in learning a bit more about fashion history and especially royal fashion history, you can find me over on TikTok at The Royal Wardrobe. You can also pre-order my book of the same name um, over on Amazon, Waterstones, WH Smiths. Um, and you can also find me on Instagram, and that's at Rosie H. Hart. Amazing. I'll have the link for the book in all of the varying descriptions, dependent on where you are consuming this media currently. Thank you for tuning in to the Beyond the Scenes podcast. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to keep up to date with future episodes of the podcast and more from Eternal Goddess, make sure you're following us on Instagram. <laughs>